Uh, I mean, this uh, is a high volume technology that of you know, plus the specialize in making a skinnier module. They make by the billions every year. The alignment optical uh, alignment is critical. To do this, I am flat optics that show you we can replace full just. One lens, so that's very significant. You make it, and so uh, the uh, alignment product is non existent, which reduces cost in a dramatic way because the alignment is an issue. In salt, special shape in this component. Tiny misalignment, you mess up the phase, okay, so you don't get the image that you're supposed to get. And this is the beginning. I always like to show this because I think. This is the only case where almost any math you can know what to do. I'm make a lens that's uh, diffraction limited, it means uh, that the spot is limited by the size of the wavelength. Okay, so I have a surface which is basically flat. What do I have? So, what you do is uh, the meta surface is. Uh, Designed so that point by point it compensates the phase shift between a, a ray, which is at a diagonal, and the chief ray. Right? So it has to be phased to compensate from this uh, difference in propagation phase with the opposite sign. So this is the difference in phase between this part, the generic. So if I phase it this way, then everything converge here and I have constructive type of interference. So this is a target phase that I need to achieve. And then, of course, I have a digital structure. So point by, by point, I have to choose pillars that create a phase shift. And this is shown here, phase as a function of the meter of the pillar that I want to match as close as possible this target phase here, this is focal lens. And I want to have a phase coverage of at least 0 to uh, 2 pi because I have to reconstruct the waveform. If I do that, it works pretty well. I mean, this is simulation that my group uh, did for a, for a uh, metasurface. And this was the earlier work on doing metasurfaces uh, for visible wavelengths. We use titanium dioxide, which is a material. Uh, which is a material which is transparent in the actual visible. It has high refractive index around 2.5 across the visible, which means that you can that the light is quite confined to these pillars. And the, the technology is a combination of electron beam lithography to make this pattern and atomic layer deposition, so that you can conformally cover these ridges here. You do an etch, and then you do a development process. At the end, you are left with this very nice structure here. Note that the uh, pillars are really vertical to within one degree, and it's a reproducible process. In this case, the uh, height is 600 nanometer. We can control the sizes basically any way we want. Uh, and uh, so it works well. And uh, um, so this is the early paper. Uh, this one was uh, with the lenses that were polarization sensitive. You see that these are fins the same size that are rotated. So here we use a so-called geometric phase or berry phase to control the uh, to control things, but I'm not really going to go discuss this. This is more practical lens, which is polarization insensitive. Okay, and these are three lenses. My group made three lenses optimized for the red, blue, and green. Means optimized means that the you eliminate the spherical uh, aberration for a, a particular wavelength, uh, red, blue, or actual green. And uh, if you measure the so-called point spread function along the, uh, the optical axis, you will see that in the focus, you get a very good iry function, which means you are diffraction limited. But the so-called strelation, which is strel ratio, which is a measure of how close you are to diffraction limit, there is between typically 0.85 to maybe 0.95. The efficiency is actually quite good. We didn't bother to optimize it here, but you can go up to 80% depend on the wavelength. So this was a very good existence uh, proof. Now you might say these are these are these are Fresnel zones. Uh, conceptually, yes, but with a big difference. Okay, essentially, um, 
what happens here is that uh, the metasurface provides a, a momentum, a, effectively a wave vector to bend the beams, the rays, right? So if you get uh, if you get closer, to, if you get closer to the edge, you have provided a larger wave vector. Okay, so that the rays arrive in phase at the focus. So this is why these are shorter and shorter period. Okay, we did a study with Zeiss because they actually were interested to see how better this is than Fresnel optics. And the key advantage is, is that the angular bandwidth of these lenses is much larger than Fresnel lenses because you don't have the shadowing effect. There is a shadow effect when you have these spins, okay? So since you have a large, larger bandwidth, the so-called etandu, which is an important concept, the ability to transport light over a long distance with this optics over a significant distance is much greater than Fresnel. And we published a paper with them, and that established our credibility because, you know, worked with actually Zeiss, and they and actually came in my lab and measured these lenses, measured the aberration. So this is a very significant uh, things. And you can do with Fresnel dispersion in, uh, in uh, engineering period. So for me, the argument is sort of closed. Now, I'm always willing, of course, to argue about it. So this is an, a real world type of application. I remember that I was quite excited when Professor Suter called me. She works at the Mass General, and she said, Federico, we have an application for you. We are trying to make this bronchoscope to look at bronchial cancer. This is like a periscope that you put down. The optical technique is optical coherence tomography, which I won't explain here. It will take about 10 minutes, although it's well established. And so they, they mounted their commercial lenses. They tried ball lenses, graded index, and you can see the focal spot is blurred here. There are aberrations, spherical, but others. So my students jump into action. They made an amorphous silicon lens. This amorphous silicon because it's for the infrared. They mounted it here. You see, you get a nice diffraction limited spot. So then we, uh, our collaborator, Mass General, uh, they did some tissue imaging, and they looked at images here, both ex vivo and in uh, and in vivo sheep lines. And you see, the interesting things are these glandular patterns that are wavelength scale and represent, in a sense, the beginning of bronchial cancer, which they could not image before. We wrote a nice paper together. We are now continuing to work, and hopefully the idea is to commercialize this new type of endoscope, which, of course, will take, uh, will take time. Now, this is, I think, uh, the change the minds of also, you know, when you, when you claim something useful, companies are always skeptical, and they should be skeptical, because they say, we are in the real world. You are just professors inventing new things, which I accept up to a certain point. So I said, I want to demonstrate that if we can do these lenses with the technique of integrated search, which is TQV lithography, this will send a message of the convergence between uh, chip uh, making and uh, lens making, which means we can abandon molding of glass or things for certain application. Of course, refractive optics will always be be here until the end of the universe, whatever. Okay, but still, I think flat optics will occupy a significant uh, space. So these are lenses that uh, one of my students, John Super, made uh, with uh, um, glass, uh, one centimeter, and uh, really with a standard technique of uh, IC, which is DQV lithography up of the Cornell facility, it uses a 248 nanometer this is the description line here, and it's a refraction limited lens. This was optimized for the red. There are 160 million nanostructures per lens. And that really convinced a lot of people in actual companies this stuff is real. And uh, so recently, my group uh, did something <laughs> nice. It started to question why don't we make holes rather than pillars, right? Because with pillars, we can only reach certain heights. But with holes, we can make a higher aspect uh, uh, ratio. So this was a neat uh, idea. They, de they decided to do it in silicon. In fact, I encourage them because, you know, we want to work with material platform. If we want to innovate at the design level, we might, we might as well just uh, stay with standard material. So they choose silicon to make nanomembranes. They were thinned down, perforated 5 micron. 
okay, and the process is actually an industrial process. It's a so-called Bosch process here. They were able to make really vertical uh, nano, nano holes, okay, and uh, I don't really have time to discuss the fabrication detail, but they measured the optical uh, properties. Now we have a professional setup to measure the so-called mo modulation transfer function. When you take the point spread function, which is intensity distribution along the optical axis, you can take the modulus of the Fourier transform, and that gives you the ability to see, to separate uh, in, uh, in uh, individual features, right? So it's, uh, it's this quantity here versus line, line pairs per millimeter. And you see the, uh, the data show it's very close to the ideal situation of diffraction limited. In fact, if you look at the point spread function in, in the focal point, you see that it's exactly what you supposed to be ideally very close to IA. Most important, you see, we looked at other multi -foci. If you look at Fresnel optics, there are always multiple foci along the optical line. You can't get rid of them. Here, they're always here, but by dispersion engineer, by careful design, you can eliminate multi -foci. They are here, but they are about two orders of magnitude less intense than the main focus. So the problem is basically solved, and I think this is a complementary technology to make holes. Now I want to go to achromatic uh, lenses, okay? This is a known technique. In 1730, an English gentleman managed to patent this doublet because he says, if I can correct, if I can correct, uh, the, if I can use two different materials, essentially I can get two wavelengths to focus in the same point, okay? And if I can, and if the dispersion of glass is not too strong, as I change wavelength, uh, maybe this creates close to an achromatic lens. It was not quite too achromatic, means all the wavelengths are focused in the same point. Then people made a triplet, it got better, a, a so-called super achromat with four, four lenses. This is the famous Zeiss lens and so forth. But you see, you are limited with this strategy of getting achromatic behavior by the choice of glasses, right? And by the fact that you have to put multiple lenses. That's one of the reasons why why they're so uh, uh, thick uh, uh, lenses, okay? They're for two reasons. You want to make them achromatic and you have to eliminate the field curvature. You know that an image of an optical system is always on a curved surface. That's called a Petzval curvature. It's not an aberration, really, although it's called an aberration. So with our strategy, in fact, we have shown with a single lens, you can correct all the aberrations, including the uh, the chromatic one, although that's a bit more tricky. So this was our first broadband achromatic lens. And so here the, the physics is actually, can be explained fairly uh, simply here. We treated these as waveguides, right? So you can write the phase, you can decide to tailor expand this to any order that you want around the wavelengths, for example, the green wavelengths. First time is a so-called group delay. This represents the actual time it takes for light to traverse any of these spin here. If you take the, the, the length divided by the group velocity, you get exactly the group delay. And then there is a group delay dispersion and so forth, okay? So the physical idea is to arrange things in such a way that all the wave packets arrive here using Fermat's principle, which I like a lot because it gives you a beautiful intuition or what happens, you know, and the fact is Fermat's contribution was immense in my opinion because it was the first example of the use of variational principle in physics, in optics, and you know that variational principle sit uh, above Maxwell's a, a, uh, equations, basically. You can derive them from variational principles, right? You can decide, you can write a uh, Grangian for, for the electromagnetic fields and so forth, okay? So here the packet is designed so that all the wave packets arrive at the same time here to constructively interfere independent of the position where they take off and on and on the wavelengths, okay? So you have to engineer here to hear you, you need a slow light, right? How? By dispersion engineering, you change the size of these pillars, so you change the effective index, so you change the group velocity, 
so that the time to go from here to here is exactly the same from the time to go to here to here. Right? So it works like, like a, a charm because also you have a good physical picture, right? And also you have to make sure that the packets arrive here uh, without distortion, not only at the same time, but without really changing shape, right? And this is contained in the actual second term, in the actual uh, second term here, the group delay, the uh, dispersion. So if you do that, you see this is what, it's actually, the, it's two, this is the first uh, single lens that is acrobatic focusing, and you can see here the data. Okay, the focus remains the same as a function of frequency. You can make a lens which is not achromatic, and you can see then uh, that you, you get uh, a change in focus with wavelengths. You get white light focusing for this one. You see it's white light. Um, so it works pretty well, but there is a limit in this strategy which now we are starting to overcome because you have to compensate from the uh, delay between here and here then if you have to make a large lens, you run into problem of finding, uh, you have to make these large libraries of pillars, right? In fact, typically for such a lens, you have 10,000 elements and you have to choose them to match the phase, the group delay, to get the diffraction limit at all wavelengths. This strategy becomes more and more difficult as you make this larger. This was only 50 micron diameter. There are still useful lenses you can do, but you want to go to millimeters. So are we going to do this? We said, well, Let's not do such hard work, and let's take a refractive lens, like this is from Toro Labs, which is fully aberrated, right? So the colors are converted, uh, are focused in different points, and now let's put a metacorrector in front, and let's try to do this. The, we want to have the short wavelengths being pushed forward, so, and the red wavelengths pushed backwards, so everything is focused on this plane here. So you, uh, conceptually, it's very simple. You have to design a meta surface here to put in front and such that at short wavelengths, the phase, you see the curvature is upwards. At longer wavelengths, it's downwards. Why? This acts like a diverging lens, so it pushes the shorter wavelengths forward and, and it has instead the opposite sign here so you have the opposite type of effect, and so that all the wavelengths then can converge here. This works actually pretty well, and so we were able to go now to a 1.5 millimeter size meta lens. Okay, you can see here that all the you can see that diffraction limited uh, focusing uh, uh, across the interior visible. So that was very encouraging for us, and we are continuing on this strategy here now. If you want to make the lens larger. Now we are still going back to try to make the whole lens just a single meta surface, making a diffraction limited achromatic uh, uh, lenses, and we had to use inverse D uh, design. And this is something that when we started to, I encouraged my group. We said if we we don't start to use artificial intelligence to design lenses, we are not going to be able to uh, compete anymore. You know, I am a physicist, so physicists like intuition, simple model, so I cringed. I said, oh my God, we're going to lose sight of the physics here. No, we don't lose sight. You, 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 you define an objective function. You see, for example, maximizing the field, uh, the field at a certain point, you, you, can, you usually create a meta-atom library. And so for then you create a kind of an, uh, an, 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 kind of an optimizer. Get some water here. So the strategy is here, and this way you can design lenses that are centimeter diameter. So you cast your design function as a figure of merit, and you you iterate the process. You start with a random distribution, okay? You you calculate the field. Then there is a process called creating the adjoint field, or you can do it by backward propagation. Basically, at every loop. You try to get closer to the to the target, right? To the maximization, right? And so it's about calculating the gradient of the figure of merit with respect to ER. What is the ER? That's a distribution of the effective refractive index, right? Which you can change as you change these pillars in uh, uh, distance and so forth in actual distribution. You change the distribution of 
effective dielectric constant, so to achieve a maximum or your minimum in your of, uh, in your in your of, uh, in your in, in, in your objective function. And here we have a nice collaboration with the group of Steve Johnson at uh, at MIT. And in fact, this was uh, this is the first example of a lens. Uh, that uh, was designed with a combination of forward design and uh, inverse design, basically, where we, we wanted to achieve an RGB lens, which focused the primary colors at exactly the same focal distance, okay? And actually, you, you can see here that we succeeded pretty well here. And the idea is to uh, divide these in zones, okay? And so you want to achieve constructive interference between the primary color at this uh, at, a, at a design focal lens. Once you do that, you want to also achieve constructive interference between these different zones, okay? And this second part is dealt by inverse uh, design, uh, basically. So this is actually the first, uh, the first step. And uh, the next is, you see, to uh, inverse design large scale uh, uh, meta lenses. And here, in fact, we have gone up and these are the recent three uh, results not published yet where we made one centimeter diameter uh, uh, lenses of titanium dioxide okay and the very significant point the wavelengths are really you can say practically exactly the same focus where only 0.03 percent deviation from the design focal lens diffraction limited so we are on to the next step is try to make a fully uh, a broadband uh, across the visible large lens uh, and uh, using this inverse the uh, design technique. And again, uh, this is explained maybe better than before what do you determine your objective function, your initial random design uh, is an objective function, a, a uh, evaluation here. There is a series of loops that then leads to, uh, to this is an optimization problem. Now the physics is not lost. The physics comes after. Once you've done, you have to understand what you've done, right? And that comes a hard part, you know. And sometimes we've been very frustrated. It's taken longer to understand what we have done than to actually do it, you know, which sort of inverse the thing is upside down, which are still for me hard to swallow, but you know, we, we just have to do it. That's that's the way it is. So now I call, we like to call this from cubism to surrealism, you see. The ultimate thing is to make structure where you go uh, away from standard geometric forms. This is called free-form optics. You know, in refractive optics, is there free-form optics? Absolutely. Like, you know, it's a toroidal grading, it's very complicated stuff, but you, the phase control is very hard. So here, ultimately, you see, we, make, we want to make complex meta-atoms where we have maybe two layers, and on top, for example, here we have a we have this uh, interesting shape here, which you know you can say this is science fiction. I don't think it's science fiction that the orthography can do it. It's only a matter of time. We've started to do it with even the orthography, and I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, we haven't really published anything, but I tell you where we can go, and this is uh, thanks to is a, a very experienced people in uh, my uh, group. You see, in fact, this is a two-layer meta-atom. You see, this is a meta-atom that has few silica, and on top it has titanium dioxide. This platinum here is just when you take an image, you want to eliminate charging, okay? It's not that you need platinum, okay? But you see, these are very complex meta-atoms. So free-form free -form optics is a really new frontier for this meta surface, and I think ultimately it find its own application. I will tell you now about my optimism about this technology. I started this company with my former student, Rob, Rob Devlin. It was kind of an, ad, of, of an adventure because we started very well, and then we found ourselves without money. I was stuck in Peru because of COVID for two weeks. And then I heard the news at our board meeting, we had only two weeks of cash left, two weeks. Then it's over. You close down everything, you won't go. Fortunately, one of our investors, Ching Wan Virtual, came to help, gave us one and a half million dollars to get started again. We fired the former CEO. The new CEO is now my former graduate student. The company has taken off and investors are in Intel. This is no coincidence. Applied material that is the main maker of chip of, of of equipment for chips, 3M and so forth, 
and and uh, so the the vision is we are going to moving from from this technology plastic still refractive optics which is quite complex to flat optics okay which make things thinner more compact more easy to make and open up some new application which i think will happen and they are making in fact this is an existence proof you see this is the equipment made by by ACE, asml to make chips instead here we enter a design file a design file and uh, uh, this is made by one of those four foundries i cannot tell you who it is because this is sort of uh, private information but it's an existence proof they took a 12 inch wafer of glass and made 10,000 uh, amorphous silicon metal lenses, okay? What's the application? Depth sensing in cell phones, for example, face recognition cameras. So there are tools here. You could design to, to cut them out and sell them or to integrate them with an actual sensor. But you see, this is, this is the exciting picture. If you take a camera module for a cell phone, other camera module, this is typically for a contact image sensor, you see you have these complex lenses and the sensor, the intensity fades away from the middle. This is just the refractive optics. As you change, if you go out to here, the light gets bended and intensity has to be less, right? That's physics, right? But with a, uh, you see a metal lens here. Now what you have is an aperture and a lens. This replaces the whole stack the whole stack, okay? So you can imagine the simplification. Moreover, you can show that by designing this lens, you can make them telecentric, meaning that even if I move away towards the edges, the intensity remains basically practically the same as at the center. You can see here the metal lens, right? You can uh, you see for a conventional four plastic lens camera module, you see the fading. This is fundamental. It cannot be improved with this technology, period. Okay, now there is some more distortion here, you can see, and the reason that distortion is actually corrected by software in actually cell phone, which is done here, okay, but here, uh, but so we, we, we don't, that's going to be solved separately, the distortion. <coughs> so this essentially corrects all, uh, all, uh, all the aberration except the chromatic one, this is optimized for particular wavelengths, which is in the infrared. And you see, the idea ultimately is to make a, a, the lens that project the 10,000 spot of a, a vertical cavity surface emitting laser array that is in this cell phone here to recognize your face, okay, to, uh, re to replace the, the projector, which is complex, you see, uh, with a simple one, a simple with a single lens. And this has got to have an impact, right? So. Now, uh, quickly, I want to move to the depth, uh, to uh, depth sensing. This was a beautiful collaboration with a group of Todd Zickler at Harvard. They're interested in computational imaging. And the idea here was to try to, you know, do what a jumping spider does. A jumping spider jumps about five times or six times the length of, of their body to capture the actual prey because it has two retina. And by measuring it, it's, even though it's a tiny brain, it's not a very intelligent animal, it's highly specialized, okay? It can tell exactly the depth and capture. So this is shown for a beautiful science paper. Well, this is this uh, interesting beast here, you see? Captures a fly, right? So now the, um, so it has four eyes, but the specialized eye that does this is this eye here, okay? And so what it has, I'm going to fast forward here, is it has an actual uh, multiple uh, retina here. The ones that are functional for depth sensing is this here that are particularly sensitive to green light, right? So the brain does a computation, and for the amount of uh, defocus can calculate the depth map. So a very uh, bright uh, uh, graduate student, Zhu, Zhu Jun Shi, which now works for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for Facebook, who thought about a very clever way. She said, well, Federico, I can't do this because this, this is too complicated making two. Why don't I make just a metal lens here, which has two focal lengths, right, which creates on the sensor plane images with different amount of defocus. Then our friends in computational images found the algorithm, device the algorithm to calculate from this defocused image the depth map. Okay, you see color gives you the distance here. So, and this is here, it's a simple type of a, uh, equation, alpha and beta, the parameter of the lens, 
uh, and so you take the difference in intensity point by point, you take the uh, La uh, Plasha, this is called so called La Plasha filter, and then you can actually compute the depth map. Now, what's the point? Look, I, I profess my uh, ignorance almost complete in computational imagery, so I'm quoting what our great collaborators told us. Okay, if you try to do the stuff of uh, uh, depth imaging that we'll show you in one minute from now, hopefully the movie works well. Okay, the amount of computational power is more than 10 times what is used, uh, what is used here. And in fact, typically for depth density, uh, you might need a, a very complex, uh, you need a complex uh, computational uh, budget here. So this is what my student uh, built. Okay, a photo sensor. Okay, this is the uh, actual done with titanium, with titanium uh, uh, dioxide. And hopefully the movie will work. You see, so what you see here is this. These are the two images, okay, defocused, and one computes uh, the, uh, the depth map. This is meters, okay? We hope in the future to go to meters. Candle flame, by the way, this is very difficult to do with uh, certainly time of flight and even with actually stereo vision, okay? But this is easy to do with moving uh, object with this. These are, fruit, these are fruit flies, okay? So we think actually, you know, this is a lot of promise and we are, we just, um, we're going to put in more effort in my group because I think ultimately we want to have an impact on the computing, on the imaging part. Okay, for this technology, I'm going to move uh, quickly to uh, multifunctional uh, meta surfaces. And uh, so uh, this is quite a, a unique aspect of this uh, technology is that you can, you make a meta surface, you can design it so that for different incident wavelengths, it creates different functions, it creates different beams. Or you can use the K vector as a node. If you are incident with different K, you will uh, create different optical function, or you can change the incident polarization and make it this, which I actually think is something quite exciting. So, you know, for example, what a vortex beam is, a vortex beam is a beam where it has an optical angular momentum. Basically, it's like a corkscrew, Right, and so the number of turns of the wave, uh, number of turns of the of the wavefront per unit uh, length uh, gives you the so-called optical angular momentum. So it is actually quantized. So you don't only have the spin angular momentum, which relates to polarization, but the optical angular momentum. So it's quantized at the at the single photon. Uh, uh, level, so you can now make a structure that, depending on the incident wavelengths, creates different beams. The Gaussian beams are basically different beams with different optical angular momentum, and this is again work from my former student Zuzun uh, Chin. She designed a reflective lens. So you design the phase here. You see here there is not only the phase of lensing or focusing that I showed you before, but there is this L theta terms which actually gives you the vortex, right? So she was able to create a metasurface that for different incident wavelengths creates either a Gaussian beam here, okay, or, a, or, an, or an orbital angular uh, momentum uh, with a small vortex here in the green or in the blue where, with a larger vortex. So this is a simple, but I think a pretty powerful type of example of what we mean by multifunctionality this is the, uh, one of the most recent uh, uh, work from my group, uh, led by Christina Spegele, one, one of the very brilliant students, Michele Tamagnone, who works for Italian Institute of Technology, and in uh, Genova, and I have two <coughs> former group members, Antonio um, Ambrosio, who works here in Milano of the Institute of Technology, and also Marco Piccardo, who works here in uh, Milano. So the idea was here to create, you see, a meta, so-called supercell metasurface, okay? And this is an interesting challenge now because you try to achieve now high efficiency and large angle, and so can one do that and create multiple functions? So if you come in with light, now in parallel create multiple functions. So on one order of diffraction, you might have a, a vortex beam here, you might have a vessel beam and so forth. It's kind of a Swiss knife, uh, uh, type of thing, right? By the way, I didn't mention you the focusing efficiency comes always the question, but on the lenses that our startup uh, is making, they have achieved more than 90% focusing efficiency. So I consider that problem solved. 
Now, if you try to achieve focal, uh, you know, at large angle here, you have to do a special design which relates to essentially using uh, you know, using supercell metasurfaces, which I will describe. These are the simulation you see, and these are the experiment for such a thing. And here, the angles can be as high as plus or plus or minus sixty degrees. And here was designed so that the transmission efficiency was basically comparable around 30% for each diffraction order. So we consider this a very significant uh, de uh, development in terms of extending the application space of metasurface. So the idea here is you see, you start from a, typically you take a unit cell. Here you have more complex unit cell. You can create these metagradings. The next step is to create, you know, different supercells at different position, and so you really have a created supercell library that gives you tremendous flexibility in designing this diffraction order. That's the main point. This is one thing, and this is actually a very nice application that uh, uh, my group did here. They were inspired by the fact that we have in our lab an external cavity laser, and you know, if you want to tune them, you have a gain, you have a gain medium with a certain bandwidth, and you want to tune the actual the, the emission. Uh, right, and the way you tune the wavelengths, you typically rotate the actual gradient. It isn't as simple as you think, because if you rotate it, but you don't do anything else, you will have more jumps. So you have to rotate, but also shift it. So they ask the question now, can I make a, an external cavity laser with a different sort of principle using this metasurface? Essentially, just by vertical transition here, I can do tuning, there is no rotation, okay? And essentially what happens is this, you use one order of diffraction for feedback. For feedback, here. again, this is a metasurface case, multiple beams. And a different one is actually, this is the exit beam you're interested in, and this is suppressed here, right? And so if you translate this vertically, you get very significant tuning. This is a semiconductor laser. I think this is quite exciting. In fact, we want to try to also thinking of uh, uh, commercializing the we are in touch with a number of companies because I think that this is a tremendous simplification compared to other external cavity uh, uh, to external cavity uh, laser. In fact, what well, we also we also demonstrate that the output can be a hologram. You see, this is interesting. You see, so I didn't mention a lot about for, about the holography. There's a lot of interest. I think probably I'm running out of time. Do I have five more minutes? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good. Because this, maybe I should have shown this before. This is really the most recent uh, work. I told you about optical angular momentum that you can create vortex beam. Essentially, the pointing vector spins around the direction of propagation. And as long as the beams do not have a large uh, angular uh, divergence, you can quantize the optical uh, the moment this way. I mean, this is not obvious at all, you know. When the paper came out, people said, well, this must be wrong. How can it be? Well, but then they did the quantum optical measurement, you know, at a single photon, they see photons can carry also optical and angular momentum. And so this is actually the work is the brainchild of one of my brilliant uh, postdoc, uh, Ham, Ham, Hamed Dora. And he figured out a very clever way. He said, Perico, why don't we try to create an optical beam where the polarization changes along the axis of propagation? This is an interesting question, but you can immediately uh, uh, avoid it. Oh, you want to get yes. better action. <laughs> <laughs> so can I, have, uh, the, uh, can I have this change along here, the polarization? Moreover, can I create a structure now, a single metasurface, that for a given incident polarization, I have uh, the wavefront as it propagates changes. You see, there is a change of optical angular momentum along the propagation direction. And then can I make it switchable? That now if I hit it, for example, with a, with a different eigen polarization, perpendicular to this one, I create a different evolution. So here we go from small to large vertex, and in between you see there's very interesting interference, and here instead I have a different development. Okay, and then ultimate thing, can I create a structure that as the beam A falls along the optical axis, both the polarization, the optical angular momentum changes. 
when he suggested this to me, I said, you know, this is uh, nice and cool, but I think we are violating uh, optimum, uh, the angular momentum conservation. But actually, that's not true, because this is, uh, we are not violating, we would be violating, because if we are saying we are propagating inaccurately space, how can it be? It must be conserved. You see, it's, thought that it's always conserved if you do the integral of the spin and, and orbital angular momentum density separately along the transverse, you see it's a conserved quantity. This statement is actually true along for a relatively small angle, maybe plus, again, it's not exact boundary, maybe plus or minus uh, five, 10 degrees, so that I can observe this vorticity changing. Right, so nothing is related. The laws of physics are still true, fortunately. So this is the first uh, step. And the idea is, we want, since we want to propagate this for a significant distance, to have a Bessel-like behavior, right? Bessel beam propagate without diffraction. So here, now here, you know, the, there is a lot of mathematics uh, around. In fact, there is expand. There is a an expansion of Fourier optics, which we call matrix Fourier optics, that my uh, group uh, uh, pioneered. And this is a very interesting paper because it's a it's a very it's a it's a real novel of Fourier optics. Okay, which led us to create a new polarization sensitive camera. But I don't have the time to discuss this. But the calculations here are used to design this meta surface. So we want to create a a bit. See, typically, if you want to create a modulation of the intensity, a beating along uh, the intent, uh, propagation of direction, you overlap, for example, two plane waves with the same frequency and different kz. This is obvious. Now, what if I want to use uh, uh, create a, a vector, the vector case? Then, then I will beat uh, plane waves, for example, with opposite circular polarization, different kz. Right uh, here, instead, you see, want to create a beam that essentially remains. Close to diffraction limited, so uh, the uh, these uh, the waves that we combine are actually Bessel waves. Okay, so what this metasurface creates a superposition of this pencil-like Bessel beam, which have different kz, what means different cone angles, right? So it creates a really a cone of these uh, of these pencil beams, that then beat spatially, okay, to uh, create. Uh, to create a change in polarization along the optical axis. So that's the thing. And this is the simplest example. We've done more complex stuff. A Z-dependent polarizer. So the idea, we have a metasurface here. You take, uh, you take the incident polarization first uh, along, uh, uh, along X. And we measure with uh, using a 4F system the intensity along the propagation. You see... It's as if you had a polarizer, a virtual polarizer along the axis. It's kind of neat. So the intensity fades away, right? Uh, and then if we do, uh, uh, TV reaches is a minimum. And then uh, for Y, polarization is the opposite behavior. So it's as if you had virtual polarizer along the direction of propagation. And uh, the next one is to do this now, more complex task. How can we have a varying uh, vortex along along the, uh, the Z direction, right? By the way, what we use as a setup before is a 4F uh, setup. Essentially what we do here, okay, what, what is of interest uh, uh, to us is actually here after the metasurface. And we, with the 4F system, essentially we image on this side here, right? It's exactly a 4F distance here. We do the image with a, with a CCD. The key point is, is there is a Fourier filtering here, right? Here we create, the, there is the Fourier plane. And because of the aperture of this, we actually, uh, we actually, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we uh, eliminate, we don't see the higher order of diffraction. Why is that, you see? When the optical angular momentum changes because of these uh, beating waves, okay, along uh, the propagation direction, where, where does the rest of the light go? We have to always conserve the, the spin and optical angular momentum in the transverse plane, right? So that is light that we want to eliminate. So we do this, uh, this, uh, this filtering here. And then so the images that you actually see here are the replica of what you see on this side here 
but without these uh, higher order of diffraction that sort of disturb the vision. Now, to go back to this here, okay, here what we create essentially two combs. These are really combs, okay, not frequency combs, but combs in K space. Okay, so it implements two set of combs, again, two sets of mode with different optical angular momentum. It launches them, okay, and then they start interfering, right? This is for a particular wavelength, of course, which is the actual green. And if you do the modeling, you see, because of this complex interference, here you see one vortex, and as you propagate, you see, and you see these are actually classically in, in entangled states, okay? As you move along, you develop your nice vortex, and in fact, this is this nice petal structure here, and uh, we look at the evolution with the same system here. We look at the evolution, and this is actually shown here. In fact, I can show you the image, so I will spare you. Is it this go? Well, somehow the movie is not activated, but you see, when you hit it, let's say you have, oh yes, you see? So this is, we hit it with one eigenpolarization, the elliptical one. And so the vortex evolves from, from, uh, from small to large, and in between you have this complex interference. See? And uh, see here, the complex interference, and at the end, you have the vortex. Again, and here instead, when you hit it with the, either, with the other eigenpolarization, which is this here, you see, as a different type of evolution by, by design. So this is really, I think, quite exciting what it opens up. Okay, the, uh, the most uh, recent work is this on polarization singularity here. The champion is my group, is another brilliant graduate student, Daniel Lim. Okay, and you know, singularities are actually, anytime you have a parameter that is not defined, like the longitude at the actual North Pole or the South Pole, you have a coordinate singularity. Of course, gravitational field, black holes, you have an optical singularity along the vortex, the intensity is zero, the phase, the, the phase is undetermined. So, and you see typically the singularity is actually a speckle pattern. If I had a laser pointer, I pointed on the wall, I see speckle. These are actually vortex uh, singularities. They're very interesting. They were studied by Michael Berry for many years. So uh, we asked this question here. And this is uh, in, in a paper that we published as soon as, what if we want to make an extended singularity region, a region of dark, arbitrary shape, where the intensity is zero and the phase is undetermined? Now, and that is a relevant question, both scientific and for application. So, the computation is pretty, uh, so the, but the idea is very simple. You see, you, this is, you, you take a complex scalar field, you have a real and imaginary path. So if I, if I have intensity zero, point by point, it means also that the phase is undetermined, right? Because it's just the, the, the actual ratio of the real to the imaginary path. That's a tangent of the phase, right? And so it gives a singularity. So my student did some very heavy duty computational work and using gradient methods, essentially, maximizing the phase gradient orthogonal to the design sheet. So you see, uh, what, is, what determines the, uh, the singularity? I have a sheet when the real and imaginary path at zero I have to take the intersection of the real and imaginary path section. Simple to understand, right? So I can design zero dimensional singularity, one dimensional, these are known for vertices, or two dimensional like in this case. So said, what I should do, I said, well, do something that is going to attract the attention of, uh, of, uh, of people, something not trivial, maybe fun. So he said, I'm going to design a hard shapes. I'm almost done. Uh, two more minutes. Uh, so he said, why don't I design? So he designed a hard shape singular region. So on this hard surface, okay, the intensity is zero and the phase is undetermined. Okay, and then with that Fourier, that 4F system, you step through in the Z direction, and you can see if you see an actual, an actual intensity pattern, which looks like, like a hat with very low intensity, 
and so forth. And these are the simulation. I think I can even show a movie. Okay, this is the phase and so forth. This is again with the metasurface of titanium dioxide. Now, um, so, yeah, these are the movies actually. So you step this camera system and Z by Z, you can actually see, I would say this is a good demonstration. We haven't shown it yet for a significant distance because there is diffraction, but this problem, and why are we interested in this? Because you see that the dark does not have a diffraction limit, right? Uh, you all know this, like light-headed, the dark does not, you can make an arbitrary small dark region. In fact, this was used in the famous work of Stefan Hell, for which he got the Nobel Prize using STED microscopy uses this. So we want to use in the future this dark, uh, this singularity shaped in a certain way to probe, for example, complex materials with disorder, maybe even to probe turbulence, turbulent regions. So I think there's a very interesting applications for sensing. So with this, I'm down. Sorry for going over time, but the message is there is uh, the technology, I think, is beyond the point of no re- uh, term because there is significant industrial interest. Uh, we have an existence pool that you can make uh, with the same technology of integrated surfaces lenses. So I think the future is CMOS compatible flat optics for high volume markets. There's still going to be a lot of stuff that refractive can do, but they will coexist peacefully with meta optics. And in terms of science, there's a lot to do in terms of engineering, you know, new light, new dark, which I think is quite exciting. And the message is, you know, if you are involved in this area, I, tell, I told my student in time, two years ago, I said, folks, it's time to get into inverse design and into artificial in, uh, intelligence in optics simply because the space of solution is so large. It's like a spin glass. You see, there are so many minima and so forth that intuition simply can only uh, go so far. So we have to use uh, uh, AI. And eventually, once the work is done, we have to still use our brain to understand what we have done. Right? Otherwise, it's very frustrating. We have found ourselves to invent new structure without really almost thinking the machine has invented it. That's frustrating, right, for human beings. But uh, I think this is the future, so we have to adjust to it. Anyway, thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank you very much, Federico, for this interesting uh, seminar. So from quantum cascade laser to meta lens. So you have a very broad... Uh, let's say, angle of view in terms of, of research. Uh, okay, now, uh, are there any questions? I started one question across the previous seminar. So my question concerns the materials. So we were, you mentioned at some point some biomimetic optics. So do you think that with the materials for this meta optics be always inorganic, like semiconductors? Or? I usually organic materials. Right. Well, first of all, I mean, our choice of materials is uh, conservative, but of course, uh, I will definitely comment, and I have a very positive view of what your implication of what you said. You know, like when I started to work on quantum cascade laser, I said this is so difficult to design, if you can ever do it, that I want to use a material that is completely understood. Because I'm worried if I have, I can probably find a better material that, you know, but then I can make double effort. So I went to our show in Molecular Bibepitaxi here, the world's best material for surface application. We're going to do this one. And so when we started flat optics, same thing. We could have tried different materials, you know, we said we're going to use glass, we had titanium dioxide, silicon, and so forth. Now, it's still interesting. In fact, we started some work with Antonio Ambrosio um, in my group, where he and others made uh, using 2D material, Van der Waals material, right? It's very interesting. They made some polariton uh, flood optics, where you sort of focus polaritons. And this is very exciting for the physics. So, 
Definitely, and I think uh, the organics, uh, yesterday we had a beautiful seminar at the Instituto Lombardo, Delle Scienze delle Lettere, by in fact uh, by a young fellow who talked about all ads, and you know, the organic light emitting diet. So I think definitely uh, the organics are an interesting frontier to do this. I do not tell all the problems that the organics, the semiconductor people used to say that organics, you know, ah, they have defects. Yeah. And, yeah. No, nonsense. But it eventually was none. So I think uh, complex uh, materials, absolutely. But we have to ask the hard question whether, <clears throat> whether there is some, sometimes some materials have some show, there are no showstoppers on the actual physics we want to do. That is very important. But I think it's open, including conformal. You know, doing this stuff on curve, we are working with a Japanese company, it's very exciting, on new types of contact lenses. There the physics changes a bit because the boundary conditions, you know, at the interfaces, Maxwell's equation, you have to write them in a different way. So it's very, 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 a lot of applications and science. Okay, thank you. A question like that. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. I have, I have a nice question about the inverse problem. Will you, will you try to study the, the, say, the light structure? So is this, because the, the people were mentioning a sort of algorithm to call optimizer. So is this something that is much more uh, efficient with respect to brute force to find the structure, for example, just the randomly changing? Oh, abs absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, Forward design can only can only uh, can only uh, uh, get you uh, so far. The problem we have started started to see precisely is due to the choice of libraries. Because at the end, you know, I mean, for example, for a fifty micron metal lens, we had a library of around I think ten thousand elements. Now, if you make it one centimeter, you know how it's going to scale. Now, we have a program with DARPA to make a 10 centimeter metal lens. That sounds insane, right? But we have to do it uh, by inverse design. I mean, typically, the intuition is sort of use a so called backward propagation method, okay? What you do is you define, you want to have a certain wavefront, right? So, what you do is now very simple intuitively, okay? You start with a random thing. You calculate uh, with a uh, Rayleigh Sommerfeld. You know, you calculate the thing. You 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 know now the difference, right? You know the difference, right, between what you've achieved. You sort of back propagate. You know, you back propagate your desired wavefront, right? And now, and now you compare the difference, you know, between uh, the epsilon, the initial epsilon. And at each kind of I, I iteration, you get closer, and at some point, if you are within 1%, then you turn to right? So it's pretty straightforward to understand. I do not think that forward design uh, can go uh, so much. It's a real limit. It's the limit of our brains also, right? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Ricardo, you Yeah, coming back to materials. So essentially, you're designing a metal lens by playing with geometry. Exactly. In the arrangement of the meta alpha. So does it make sense to you to play also with the composition, the meta alpha, playing with you know, say different materials in different regions or with different heights, or say other degree of freedom that could be helpful to well, solve problems? Heights would be a problem because technologically you can imagine different heights, you know. I don't think that's practical, okay. But here that's why I probably flash it to too fast here, but this I think is very Interesting to do this so-called, uh, I'm almost there. I mean, this is here. So what we are trying to do here is optimize these free form meta atoms here. So here you have different in geometry, but while this is standard geometry, if you like, this is complex geometry, right? This is, uh, uh, this is free form, right? And so this uh, bilayer, this on top of this is actually one of the elements we are going to use. We have a plan to make a large achromatic uh, lens for the visible, to focus all the visible in one point, diffraction, and we think we can do it. But there's a computation in very intensity, and materials also. You see, you need to be able, uh, this is quite tall. In fact, this is almost one micron tall, the total thing. And the reason is this. 
Again, if you want to focus all the lanes, including the edges, and the edge is one centimeter uh, away from the center, you have to compensate a large phase difference in free space, which means that this pillar, composite pillar, must provide the correct phase shift to compensate this. And it's not only at one wavelength, it's broadband, you see. So you have to really, uh, it's dispersal engineering. This shows, in my opinion, a very powerful way uh, what dispersal engineering can do. Right, so that this combines what you said, geometry with different materials uh, and, uh, and uh, so forth. Realistically, I don't think it will go more than two, maybe, th maybe three layers. I mean, uh, uh, I think this will have some impact in the future, you know. The one message I've got over many years of experience, never say no. Right? <laughs> Any other question? Oh, Luca. Uh, hey, Salve, Luca. Luca. Uh, for the image application, you might have uh, uh, sort of like video, obviously, and also you might need uh, an angular view, a wide angular TV. Can you uh, build a lens uh, that can control uh, the direction of Oh, yeah, I mean, that's a very good point. Look, uh, this, uh, let me show you this here. This here, I this uh, meta lens, single meta lens with an aperture. This is uh, interesting. It's designed, it corrects for that. It has a field of view of plus or minus 30 degree, which is significant. So it basically corrects coma, astigmatism, a field curvature, and uh, a spherical. Not achromatic, because this is for face recognition. This is designed to work for the wavelengths of a vertical cavity surface emitting laser, which is contained in these holes here. I mean, this is another miracle of technology, you know. When I at Bellas, where people were working on big cell, I said, will this be very well? We only have big cell, but in next generation, we'll have a SPAD device, single photon avalanche photo layer, which is invented, pioneered here in Milano. Let's not forget that the Polytechnic, right? These are going to go in a cell phone. I think cell iPhone 13, they're gonna be there. This is amazing. You should be proud as an institution for spans, right? So yes, you can make field of view up to plus or minus, uh, plus or minus uh, 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 60 uh, degrees. The focusing efficiency of this was more than 90%. Again, people said, you know, it can be done. And I said, Trenel can do it. I said, will you understand that this can do much more than Trenel? Of course we use, Diffractive optics. It's only Maxwell's equation, right? But we can do much more, right, in terms of design. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> okay. Any other question? Okay. okay. So maybe we thank again Federico for.